Hello everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to the next event in our 2020 Thought Leadership Online series. And I hope you are well wherever you are joining us today. As always, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today. We proudly recognise their strong connections to land, sea and community. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to traditional custodians of all of our lands. It's fantastic to be joined by so many of you again. We're proud that we can connect our members living and working around the world and explore new frontiers for the resources industry. We love that we have this platform that allows us to connect our global communities and hear from world leading experts especially in these uncertain times when many of us are not able to meet face to face. As the peak body leading the way for people in the resources sector, AusIMM is proud to showcase leadership through events like this. For AusIMM, this is at the heart of what we are and what we do. We are the trusted voice, creating communities and bringing people together to learn from each other. This is something we've been doing for 127 years now. This connection and sense of belonging with AusIMM's global community has helped me in many different ways throughout my career. So welcome and thank you again for joining us. So far this series, we've heard bold visions for the mining sector and by bringing people together to learn from each other, we are also helping shape careers create communities and reinforce the role of, of professionals in upholding standards. Our series continues today with what is sure to be another fascinating and very topical discussion. Fergus Hansen is joining us to explore one of the most important topics for modern mining companies and professionals, that of cyber security. This is going to be a high level discussion ranging from skills and capabilities to geopolitics and policy. Not only do we have Fergus as an expert in this field, but our wonderful MC, Kat Matson also has a very strong background in digital innovation. This is a topic they are both really passionate about, and it's going to be a lively and engaging conversation with plenty of opportunities for you to type your questions in as we go. Before we get underway, I'd like to thank our series partners. AusIMM is proud to partner with leading organisations who share our values. We thank our signature partner, PwC, our major partners, Dassault System, Mets Ignited and Rio Tinto, as well as all of our series and supporting partners. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Kat to begin today's conversation. Thank you and enjoy the discussion. Thank you so much, Janine, and welcome to Fergus. Here I am sitting in Brisbane. Fergus is in Canberra and I'm very keen to hear where are you watching this uh, webinar from today? Where in the world? Um, I know in the past we've had plenty of people from all over Australia, from France, from, from Indonesia. So I'd love to hear where you're watching from today. In order to leave us um, a comment or to say hello or to ask, a, ask us a question, just press the little blue hand button that you can see in the top right hand corner of your screen and just type in your question right there and let us know where you are in the world. Fergus, how's your day been? Happy Tuesday. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak with you. You're welcome. I'm thoroughly looking forward to um, to geeking out and to talking about cyber security in 2020. Before we jump in though, I'm curious, um, What's something about you that we wouldn't find in um, a Google, if we were to Google search you? What, what's, uh, what's an interesting tidbit of information about Fergus? Well, um, try to think of a mining related topic, but um, I did used to work for Andrew Forrest, but I think that is on a public record as in his private office. But I also, um, my first job actually was as a, stone, a dry stone mason. So that was my original training was um, building stone walls in a traditional Scottish method. 
That's very cool. I actually very I like that very much. I also love that we've got a number of people um, messaging through. Um, Salamat Siang from Jeffrey in Jakarta again. Uh, it's lovely to see you again. Uh, namaste to you too, Loknath from India. Um, to the to the CAD, Robin, um, how's it going from Bris Vegas? It's nice to have some locals. Um, g'day to people in Bowen. Hello from gloomy Melbourne. Yes, our love is going out to Melbourne. But look, it is September in Melbourne and of course, um, it's gloomy. That's what happens in Melbourne at this time of year. I can say that because I used to live there. Um, welcome. Oh, and hello to Rebecca, who's from Cornwall in the UK with Donald in London. You're all over the world. It's all over the world. It's fantastic. Um, and I love that you're a dry stone mason, Fergus. I just, I, that's such a hands on, practical and tactical um, skill. I almost feel like it's a lost art, but we won't get into that today. Instead, let's jump to the extraordinarily um, oh, geeky and techy um, concept. Let's start at the very beginning. What do we mean by cyber security in today's context? Um, is it a bit more than phishing emails and spam? Well, the way I describe cyber security, and I actually, um, I'm a little bit hesitant to sort of talk about cybersecurity as a geeky topic because I think one of the, the things that one of the, the problems we've got with cybersecurity is that we tend to think about it as something that is can only be solved by technical people. When I think when we talk about other types of security, we don't necessarily think that we need a technical person to do that. So the way I talk about cybersecurity is that it's the the security of the digital systems that we we use every day. So the same way that we have building security um, and we have doors on our buildings and we have locks on those buildings and we have CCTV cameras that look at those buildings and we have gates around our buildings, that's the sort of physical security that everyone takes for granted and everyone you know, walks into a building and has a sense this is a secure building or not very secure. Um, it's, a, it's the same with cyber security, it's just trying to defend those digital, the digital pieces of infrastructure that we have and making sure that the ports are blocked and the, the right controls are in place so that the people who are in that system are meant to be there. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So in a in a mining context then, um, you know, if I'm not dealing with the digital assets of a mining organisation, why do I need to be worried about cyber security? Where, what's, what's, the, what's the everyday link, if you like, for mining organisation and for people in mining? Well, I think there's a, there's a whole spectrum of reasons why you should care about cyber security from, from a mining perspective. You can look at the sort of the big, flashy, um, you know, huge damage, um, huge amounts of damage that were done through different cyber attacks. So there's been things like um, the attack on, on toll holdings that you know, brought that logistics company to its knees. And that probably had lots of flow and effects to other businesses, including uh, the mining industry. Or you can look at the, the impacts on specific companies in the mining sector. So we had a case uh, about 10 years ago where um, the British Intelligence Service notified us that you know, there was about a billion dollars worth of loss uh, incurred by, I suspect, an, uh, an Australian company um, because of a cybersecurity breach. So they're the sort of the big flashy things where you can say, well, you can point to you know a billion dollars or more worth of damage. But I think there's other other types of damage you can experience. So there's cyber criminals that can um, extort you for money. You can your your company can be bound up in a ransomware attack, or your files get locked down. That can affect your operations. Uh, you can be asked to pay a ransom to have them unblocked. So you could lose money through that. You may or may not get your system back up and running. There can be uh, reputational damage if you lose a whole bunch of people's uh, personally identifiable information. Um, and I think really importantly, you can lose intellectual property. And that's sort of a, a death by a thousand cuts where you, you gradually lose your market edge because your IP has been stolen and is being used by uh, other, other, other countries or other companies. Is it true then that, that that loss of IP too can actually happen without organisations knowing that it's been stolen? It's not like if, to use your analogy before, if somebody breaks into my house, I can see evidence that they were there. But if my systems aren't strong enough, can I always see that somebody was in my computer system? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great 
question. And the you know the the, the cliche saying in in this space is that there's only two types of companies: uh, those that uh, know they're being hacked and those that don't yet know that they're being hacked. Um, so I think. The, the nature of this industry is that everybody is, has basically been compromised at, at some point. It's just understanding to what extent you've been compromised and, and what you might have lost. That also, yeah, I think, on. sorry, go no, ahead. Go no, no, you go. <laughs> it also brings up this, you know, question of, you know, who is it that, that might be going after you? And I think it's sort of useful to break it up into different, um, you know, groups so that you can understand who you're up against. There's um, there's nation states that are going after companies, and that's for things like IP theft, but it can also be pieces of code that sort of get away from them. So we had um, instances a couple of years ago where uh, Russia and North Korea accidentally or on purpose you know, got a bit of um, ransomware that went into the wild and, and locked up you know, lots of companies around the world and, and individuals and businesses. Um, and in some cases, you know, with the not petro case, you know, caused billions and billions of dollars worth of damage to, to corporations. So that can be a sort of nation state type of attack. There can also be uh, cyber criminals. And if you're looking at the sort of quantum of the problem out there, cyber criminals are by far and away the biggest problem that we're up against. Um, they are basically out there to make as much money as easily as possible. They operate in a very permissive environment where it's almost impossible to get caught. Um, so, if, as long as you can make your system harder to break into than um, people, comparator companies or people that they could be going after, then you can mitigate some of that risk against cyber criminals. And then there's uh, what can be called sort of activists, I suppose, who are more interested in making a political statement. They might do things like deface your website, um, but they're not going to be you know, running away with um, billions of dollars worth of IP or, or trying to, you know, crash your system in a very sophisticated attack. Mm. Are there, you, you said that cyber criminals are probably the lar largest problem we face. Is that the, is that where you see companies put their attention when it comes to their cyber security systems or are they more kind of f focused on the nation state threat? Um, I think there's a, I mean, if you look at Australian industry, for example, I think there's a, there's a real spectrum of both capability and, and focus. So you have, I'd say at one end, um, banks and telecommunications companies who are under constant attack and therefore put a lot of effort into gripping up their capability to defend their systems. They still lose a lot of money, um, banks in particular, because, you know, people, they are banks, so people are going after them to steal money. Um, and then I'd, I'd say it's a sort of a cliff edge almost after that, uh, where there's a, you know, going down right down to SMEs that are really struggling to have any sort of um, sophisticated systems set up. So it's, it's a huge spectrum of vulnerability. Um, you know, how companies can, re you know, respond to that I, or which areas they go after, I think it depends on your industry. If you've got a lot of IP, um, and I think Australian companies tend to underestimate how the type of IP that they own, um, then you know, you'd be wanting to defend definitely against nation state actors. Um, if you've got a, a lot of uh, money that can be stolen or you're a large corporation that can be extorted easily through big um, invoicing and procurement programs, then you know, cyber criminals are definitely going to be going after you. Um, and if you're in a politically sensitive industry then um, yeah act, but activists as well so I think for the mining sector probably it's um, it's all three in, in some cases so with that in mind and I should have mentioned at the top of this conversation for those who haven't um, participated in these before this is very much a thought leadership conversation and I make no apologies for the fact that we will probably leave you with more questions than answers um, it's meant to be provocative it's meant to expand your thinking as distinct to give you practical this is what you can do in your workplace tomorrow um, also while I'm mentioning that um, I want to say hello to a few other people we've got somebody Jerome is in Mauritius um, we've got a few more people in Melbourne but I did see somebody from from Hobart so I think that's as far south as we've got um, visitors. Now in terms of the, the capability that we need to keep an eye on in mining organisations and particularly in managing and dealing with each of those threats that you just talked about, what do you 
mining organisations need in terms of capability, capacity and systems to deal with all of those different cyber security threats, nation states, um, activists and cyber criminals? Well, I think it, it really depends on the context that you're in. And I like to sort of think about it as, um, you know, managing risk and managing and, and thinking through what you really are trying to defend as an organisation. So one of the analogies I use is, um, you know, banks managing um, huge piles of cash. Um, now, banks don't just take all the cash and, and put it in a big pile and leave it in a paddock. They put, they sort of, they take a managed approach. So they'll have, you know, a big chunk of it at, say, their secure um, vaults, and they will build a very specific building around that um, large pile of cash. But they will also need to be operational. They have to have lots of cash at their branches, and to get it to their branches, they have to take a few moderate risks. They put it into trucks that can then drive it out to the branches, and then the, the branch pet managers manage that distribution of that cash through putting it in ATMs and and handing it over to customers. Now, there's lots of different points along the way there where that that money is is vulnerable in, in different ways. But overall, they take a, a managed approach that keeps them operational, but also you know protects the large you know the big mother load of cash that you know sits at their headquarters or uh, in their vaults. Uh, so I think cybersecurity is a, a little bit like that. Um, you want to know what your what's what what you have and what you're trying to protect. So there's a concept that was developed by um, the former head of um, the Australian Signals Directorate, uh, Mike Burgess, and, and Rachel Fork, who heads the cyber CRC, called the five no's. And that's um, knowing the value of your data, um, know, knowing who has access to your data, uh, where that data is located, uh, who is protecting that data, and how well protected it is. And I think that's a pretty good yardstick for um, lots of corporations trying to sort of think through how they manage their cybersecurity profile. If you have, you know, your crown jewels of intellectual property that would, you know, destroy your com company if somebody else got their hands on it or a competitor was able to use that and set up their own operation, then you'd want to make sure that that was very tightly controlled, you know, exactly where it's stored, who has access to it, and, and how you, you've protected that. If you've got sort of marginal conversations going on between, you know, a worker in the field who's trying to fix a, a pipe and um, they're liaising with headquarters on that, that's not really going to cripple the company if that information gets out and that can be a, a much lower security risk. So I think it's about thinking through what your crown jewels are as an organisation and thinking a bit laterally about that because competitors can use your information lots of different ways. Um, and I think thinking through some of the... the the, the risk that you could face as a corporation that other companies have experienced. So it's not just IP theft, it can be the ability to operate if you're tied up in a ransomware attack. It can be reputational damage if it's um, you know very sensitive staffing records or other, other records. Um, and it can be a financial risk if you're, um, people are able to you know, submit fake invoices or um, trick your accounts team into changing bank account details so money goes to, to different accounts, all of that can be a risk as well. I'm just not hearing you, Kat. That's because I would have been muted because I was tapping away on my keyboard. Thank you, Fergus. Um, there's a great question here from Ian um, and it particularly relates to this concept of the five no's that you just talked about, particularly in terms of knowing who's got access, knowing where it's being stored and knowing how well it's being protected. Ian asks, how concerned should exploration companies be that their exploration data that they submit to the government is secure in government files. Now, I don't obviously want to point any fingers at any organisation, but that, for me that raises a really interesting philosophical question around um, if we don't know how other organisations are storing our information, whether it's being stored on Amazon servers or servers in China, or what, whatever the case may be. So can you talk to that? Well, this was a really interesting issue I, I found with the latest national cyber security strategy that's come out. Um, there was almost uh, no focus um, in the national strategy about gripping up um, the, the federal government's defences. 
So we have um, a, a group uh, at the federal level, uh, the office, uh, the National Audit Office, who goes around and, and actually checks whether government departments are complying with their own cybersecurity standards. And there's a routine failure amongst federal government departments uh, in meeting those basic standards that have been set by the um, Australian Signals Directorate. So I think that itself is a, is a big problem. Um, government, I think, you know, different government departments have different levels of capability in terms of their ability to protect data, but we, you know, for, we, we've become aware of, of regular uh, compromises. Um, we've had attacks, for example, on the Australian Parliament uh, by nation state actors, and I think a determined actor can basically break in uh, to any system. Um, so the fact that we aren't, I think, yet investing in making sure that all government departments have, have their own systems in, in check and are doing the best that they can it is a problem. And there's lots of different vulnerabilities in, in different areas that exist and, and the, the audit office um, highlights them regularly to us. So um, I don't have, I can't give you an absolute guarantee. I don't think there's any guarantees in cybersecurity, but um, I, I would definitely have concerns. Yeah, and, and I find, yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things. It's not just about how we protect ourselves, it's how the information's being protected um, by those who we trust it with. Um, I've got a couple of questions here around um, autonomous systems. Um, so what is important for mining, particularly as more and more mining operations are using and relying on autonomous systems, what do we need to consider when it comes to cyber security for autonomous systems? Um, and the, a very specific question has been asked, should these be physically separated from the usual public web? Should autonomous systems be separated from the public web? Yeah. Um, I think it really depends on where, I mean, I think autonomy is, is another technology that will just become a mainstream technology in everything we do and there'll be, um, if you're talking about sort of autonomous mining equipment and the way that that could potentially, you know, um, be compromised or exploited, then yes, I think you'd want to have very tight controls around that and um, if, if there's intellectual property that sits around that as well, then um, yes, you probably want to make sure that that's very well protected and, and firewalling it could be one option. Um, but aut autonomy in general, will, I think, will be used in lots of ways, including in cybersecurity defences. So uh, the volumes of, of, of um, attacks that systems are coming under at the moment are, is so large that we really need autonomous solutions to be able to handle that, that scale. Um, so there's an example where you would have, you know, autonomous systems integrated into our cyber security uh, defences. And I think there will be lots and lots of um, pieces of autonomous systems joining uh, the internet, you know, in, in lots of different areas. So um, I think in general that will become a, a mainstream activity, but where it becomes, um, where it's very tricky, and I think particularly in the early stages you would want to, uh, quarantine it. One of the, the big areas of autonomy we're just on the cusp of is, of course, um, driverless cars, um, and that's an area where that will be, you know, running off a, a connected system where that creates a huge vulnerability, but it's also going to create an enormous convenience for everyone. Uh, so we're probably going to take that risk trade-off, but um, I think for the early stages, it'll be, you know, absolutely critical that we get the cybersecurity piece of that right. It's interesting you say that. I'm just reading another question that's come in. And by the way, if you do have a question, please just drop it into uh, the chat box by right pressing that little blue hand in the top right hand corner. Um, Rod asks, well, he makes the comment that we rely on cyber now for everything all the time, particularly things like internet and GPS. And when we look at a rogue, well, sorry, when we look at that increasing reliance of what you were just discussing in terms of autonomous vehicles, that will require significant um, reliance on GPS. Could a rogue state or anyone else close down a GPS and therefore um, or shut shut down cities? Is that is that a, is that a legitimate risk or is that the stuff of sci-fi movies? I think is what I'm asking. Um, no, I think it's absolutely a leg legitimate risk. One of the, the big reasons why I think there was such a, a furious debate in Australia but all around the world around. Um, the 5G build and which um, companies would be able to participate in that build was precisely because uh, the 5G network, if it lives up to its promise, 
uh, will basically be the, the peak piece of critical national infrastructure. It'll be the, the piece of infrastructure that the entire economy uh, pivots off. And if you can shut down that network, you can essentially shut down the entire Australian economy or other economies around the world. So being able to, to disable those um, kind of systems, whether it's, you know, satellite um, systems and satellites, of course, also have cybersecurity and they tend not to have had cybersecurity baked into their design. So they're an enormous vulnerability. Um, and then the 5G network where a lot of these um, positioning systems pivot off at a, at a localised level, then, you know, that's another big vulnerability. And that's why the, the companies that provide the equipment to that is, you know, it's so important where they come from and the supplies chain security behind that. It's, yeah, it's, it is just gobsmacking just how complex this entire space is. Speaking of space, and I actually didn't mean that pun, but since I've since I've gone there, I'm going to use the segue. Um, Tom is taking us back in a very, very, very big picture. Um, he's, and I'm going to read the question because there are some great words. Do you think the attitude towards cyber security in space operations is something the mining industry could take on board? Or, oh no, where did it go? Or is satellite cyber security too extreme for adoption in terrestrial operations? Um, I, no, I think, I mean, I think as far as, I mean, I'm not a, a mining expert, I'll leave that in the hands of um, your organisation. But um, my um, impression is that mining is an absolutely, you know, big, is a big user of um, geospatial um technologies and, and satellite technologies for positioning or geospatial and um, the, the cyber security of that would therefore matter uh, enormously to the industry. Um, the role that it can play in trying to strengthen that cyber security is another question that's um, there's, it's now being you know, increasingly privatised as an industry. There's lots of um, private operators out there um, who you know, basically are in charge of running their own cyber security on their own systems. So, um, the, you're basically, I think, in a position where you're a taker of other people's cyber security in that space. Um, but yeah, my instinct would be that it would be a, a really important um, thing for the mining industry. Yeah, cool. Um, I want to come back down to one of the, we were talking about the different actors and the different types of um, cyber security issues that we face. And one of the ones that I see play out a lot is misinformation. And in fact, I saw a headline today that I didn't get a chance to look into. But one of the possible mitigation strategies, for example, against um, deep fakes is an artificial um, intelligence algorithm that can detect a heartbeat in the video to determine whether it's been constructed or whether it's a deep fake. So, um, is misinformation a cyber security issue, and how do we how do we ensure, particularly in the mining sector, that we get the right information out? Well, I think misinformation. You know, we we sort of tend to think about it in the political context of you know swinging an election or trying to trick people into believing in conspiracy theories and um, you know fake news. But I think that there can be cybersecurity implications from misinformation and, and, and deep fakes. Um, so you can, if you take, for example, I think with the, in, the, in the area of deep fakes, one of the big challenges that we're going to face is enterprises, not just in the mining industry, but more broadly, and I think also in government, is um, efforts to impersonate other people of authority um, by taking you know, clips, public clips of them speaking, for example, and using that to create a, a lifelike representation of their voice um, so that they could, you could simulate a phone call where they ring up the accounts team and it's the CEO on the line and they say, please process this uh, payment I'm about to send through. It's, we've got to get it done ASAP, so just drop everything and get it done. And then the, the email appears with the invoice um, and before you know it, you've you know dispatched a, a million dollars to to the wrong bank account. So I think there is that sort of option for impersonation that can then create uh, advantage cyber criminals and make it harder for companies to operate because they have to they'll have to stop using those voice commands and and the trust authentication piece will have to be much more cumbersome initially while we work that that piece out. 
Um, so I think there is a, a cyber security element there. In terms of misinformation more generally, I think that's, it's, it's not so much a cyber security issue, but I think it can be a, uh, a, a brand uh, rep and reputation issue if you have a campaign that's um, running run against you and you have people, um, I think it's, it's easy to manufacture um, a, a perception of public um, opposition to your company or organisation or a, a stance that you've taken uh, online and it's very hard to, to get to the bottom of that quickly. So that's an area where I think companies face a, a threat online that not necessarily a cyber security threat, but it's a reputational or brand threat. Yeah. It's a it's an increasingly interesting one and a challenging one to deal with. Um, a reminder to the audience to keep your questions coming in. Um, one question that I do have is, um, I mean, and obviously, Fergus, you you sit within the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. I'm curious, what is the mining and resources sector's role in shaping cyber security? policy. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion as an outsider to the industry that there's a public, there's possibly a, uh, a belief that there's not a huge role, but the more I delve into these thought leadership webinars, the, the, it's highly important that this industry plays a role in shaping the policy. What would your thoughts be on that? Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely critical. So if you look at the the makeup of the Australian economy, um, you know one of the, the the most critical industries that we have is the mining sector, and um, we tend to I think underplay the amount of intellectual property and the the need to protect um, corporate IP in those uh, in that in that sector. And because of that, I think we, um, you know, we really need to make sure that the, the mining industry's voice is, is heard in those conversations and that the mining industry is playing a really active part in, in protecting itself from the, the full spectrum of, of cyber security threats. Uh, you know, you've got the example of, you know, the Australian company losing a billion dollars through a cyber security breach. I think there's, there's lots of areas where we have really specialized, uh, expertise in IP. Uh, in the Australian mining industry, so I think we've, we've absolutely got to protect that. Um, and I think there's also lots of you know cyber criminal activity that is, is would clearly be targeted at the mining industry that needs to be addressed as well. How okay. the industry can engage in that, I think there's lots of different ways. There's regular consultations from government uh, on development of national strategies. Uh, so we've just had one that's been uh, produced. There's consultations going on right now around critical national infrastructure. Um, but I think there's an ongoing uh, openness through the Australian Cyber Security Centre uh, and elsewhere to, to allow groups like the mining industry to come in and, and raise their concerns and participate in you know, the, the government thinking around these issues and, and feed in an industry perspective. Okay. So that's on, that's on policy and influencing broader, well, I'm going to say Australian policy. At a, at a company policy level and at a company practice level, um, how do we build the required capability? And I guess my question here is in two parts. As a, as a CEO, most CEOs aren't going to be overly familiar with what's required in the cybersecurity space and they're going to have to trust the people that they bring in to put in place the right systems. Likewise, if they're going to bring in cybersecurity companies, they need to trust that they're credible without necessarily understanding all of the threats and all of the risks and all of the solutions. So how do you build in-house capability and how do you bring in those outside experts when it's very hard to understand what it is that we're actually protecting ourselves against? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's um, it's absolutely essential that you have somebody who understra understands your business and the nature of the way that you operate and the culture in that um, organisation, in terms of people's willingness to adopt certain practices or not, or how they're how they're operating at, at, at the current moment, before you start, you know, designing a system. And um, there's no sort of, you know, easy answer to that where you can just say, well, you need these five products and just join them together, and that will, you know, sort you out. You really need to, I think, understand you know, what it is you're trying to protect, how the, how the organisation operates, and most tr difficult 
uh, of all is um, looking at the legacy systems that you have in place. So trying to take a legacy system and um, upgrade it into a you know a 21st century um, system that's as secure as you possibly can be at a realistic cost. That's you know can be quite a difficult challenge if you've got a greenfield. Um, if you're standing up a new company or you're just starting out, that can be a really nice opportunity to build um, cyber security from the ground up and it generally makes it a lot easier um, and cheaper to do that. So my sort of advice on that would be to have somebody that you trust that knows your, your company as your, your peak ch chief advisor. Um, I think lots of firms, you know, and don't, there's no sort of, I, don't, I think I'd be wary of sort of someone that says that this is sort of will solve all your problems, a particular piece of software or um, product. Um, so I think that that's key, and then um, making sure that you're that the person that you trust is is working out you know what it is that you really need and and where the pieces of data are that you really need to protect. Yeah, cool. I'm looking at, I've got so many different questions and I'm just trying to decide which way we're going to, um, which way I'm going to take you, Fergus. Um, one of the things I think that gets in the way for companies, particularly junior companies or SMEs, is that it feels like it's such a daunting investment, um, both of time and bandwidth, let alone cost. Um, how do you recommend that those kind of companies reduce their cyber risk and I guess um, balance out um, mitigate the right risks so they can continue to operate without necessarily um, yeah, spending themselves broke in trying to protect themselves? Um, well, this is, a, uh, I think, a, a, a tricky question because you, you really have to, every, every company is in a unique circumstance. But I think in general there are lots of um, proven products that are sort of industry standard um, technologies that are out there that you can you know, buy off the shelf and that can be configured to work in you know, lots of different environments. The, the areas where I think you run into challenges is where you, when you're trying to customise or you have unique products where you're trying to um, you know, do a particular, run a particular process or build something, a unique piece of software to your organisation, that's where you can run into you know, very large costs and, and um, you know, there's not sort of ongoing patching and, and vulnerability uh, fixing into those, those kind of products. So it, you can, if you have lots of those types of custom built pieces of software, it can, be, it can create a, a much uh, more difficult environment to, to protect. Um, and then I, I think trying to sort of minimise your your attack surface. So thinking through all the different, you know, what do you actually need to operate versus, you know, do you just allow staff to do whatever they want and, and download whatever piece of software that they they think they might need on a on a whim. So trying to sort of constrain that in a reasonable way is um, always a challenge. But it's um, yeah, I think something you've got to do. I think this threat surface is actually a really interesting one that we're facing at the moment in COVID, isn't it? Where we've got more and more people working from home, quite literally hacking around whatever system we would normally use in order to have a meeting, transfer files, um, understand what's going on. How, how on earth can organisations um, track, well, I guess, mitigate risks across a, an increasingly personalised threat surface? Yeah, well, this is one of the really interesting things to me about um, COVID. So, you know, we we had a lockdown here in Canberra for a while, where everyone went to to work from home. We've obviously got one, a really serious one in Melbourne at the moment. And what that has basically meant, as you know, in practice, is people all that your staff go from the enterprise environment that they normally work in um, to working at home. And people are often, you know, you. You're either, you know, if your company doesn't have your know, company issued laptops and it all sort of set up, you can end up working on your your home laptop. Um, people are trying to sort of jerry rig solutions from home all the time, and somebody doesn't have, you know, can't get WebEx on their their laptop, so they end up using Zoom or they go to a Google Hangouts or whatever it is, and you can't get on the conference call, so you do it on a 
you know, at your at your home phone or your your lap mobile. And there's all different ways that you sort of work to operate in this new environment that aren't necessarily um, the safest ways to do things, or you know, according to the the structure that your enterprise has come up with. So what you've basically done is massively expand your attack surface, and for nation state actors, for cyber criminals, um, that's a fantastic opportunity. Um, so I would anticipate that the the stats that we're going to see um, later on in terms of you know cyber theft through cyber crime would would will go up, um, and potentially also you know data breaches and and IP theft you would expect in the background to also be you know, potentially going up as well. So the cat burglars who are now out of work because they can get every into everyone's home, and that's a terrible Facebook meme. If they weren't wanted to reskill, they should be reskilling to um, cyber criminals. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the market <laughs> for cyber criminal is, is great right now, and it's um, <laughs> one of the real sort of challenges you've got as a, a policymaker in this space is that um, if you if if you have, if you're a victim of a cyber crime, you can re you report it to the police. It tends to be a local police force. If they have the time to investigate it, if it even sort of reaches their threshold of a crime, um, you know, warranting their time, um, almost inevitably the the attack will have come from overseas, and that takes it into you know jurisdictional issues that is in the too hard basket. So you, they basically you know get away with it. Um, so it's a it's a really permissive environment and uh, unfortunately a very good time to be a cyber criminal. Yeah, and all jokes aside, I actually think that brings it home. Um, it's it's one thing to feel like it might never happen to you, but if it does, um, there's not a huge amount that the normal um, enforcement um, providers can do in this case. You've just got to build your own internal resilience. Um, I want to jump, as we head towards the last few minutes of this conversation, I want to jump into some of the trends that you see in cybersecurity. When we spoke last week, you had used a phrase that has been playing around my mind ever since called quantum resistance. Can you talk us through the, this trend of quantum resistance and what it means for us in the future? Well, I suppose one of the, the big developments, um, and sorry to be troubling you during the week on uh, security questions, but um, one, one of the big technology leaps that we're sort of staring down the barrel of is the development of quantum computing. So at the moment, we've got, um, in sort of simple terms, you know, classical computers that you know, we're all familiar with and um, how they you know can gum up when you open up too many uh, windows on your browser and they have their limitations. Um, quantum computing is sort of a, a, a quantum uh, leap forward uh, where it's just a, a chalk and cheese comparison between the, the, the power of these uh, um, two computers. And what you would be able to do with a quantum computer is um, decrypt all the current encryption that we have at the moment. So if you're encrypting your documents you know, in a WhatsApp message or in a, in a workplace environment, um, the, the promise of quantum computing is that if they have, if those communications have been captured, they can now be, they will be able to be decrypted uh, once quantum computing uh, becomes a reality. So firms are trying to uh, develop what they call quantum resistance, in quantum resistant um, encryption, so that you can hopefully make your communications still a little bit extra difficult for a quantum computer to be able to crack. Uh, we don't know whether that will actually be um, doable or not, but it, it should at least help and make it much more difficult. But the other sort of great, you know, there's, there's lots of positive things that will come out of quantum computing. So if it lives up to its promise, there should be sort of amazing medical breakthroughs because you'll have this uh, phenomenally larger computing power. So it, it should be a, a wonderful breakthrough for humanity, but a, um, there will be some some downside risks, and that brings out this whole um, issue of geopolitics. So there's this race at the moment for to be the first country to to make a really sort of viable quantum computing, and, and lots of countries have you know a, a bone in the fight. There's um, you know the United States, there's China, of course, but Australia also has this really amazing um, niche capability in quantum computing, and some of our academics in places like 
uh, UNSW are doing some amazing work at, at the cusp of, of this um, technology. So hopefully Australia will be um, right at the forefront of that uh, in terms of um, breakthroughs. Well, why wouldn't we be? I mean, Australia's been at the forefront of many um, cyber and technological breakthroughs, Wi-Fi. Um, why wouldn't we be at the forefront of quantum? I guess it just means that um, that saying of the Borg really would potentially come true. Resistance is futile, right? I couldn't resist. Sorry, and apologies to everyone who's not a Trekkie. Um, you also talked when we were discuss last week when we were looking at future trends, the, the emerging trend around regulation of tech, and you touched on it before in terms of the cross-jurisdiction issue. We've seen some attempts in the last few weeks, if not the last few months, around um, nations trying to control social media and media organisations but we're still bumping in and you know and Google are currently fighting us at the moment on that and Facebook what do you think is the future around this the jurisdictional and the regulation issues are we ever going to come together as a I don't know as a single global voice to be able to effectively enforce our collective digital and cyber rules well, there's a couple of things at play here. I mean, I think absolutely we're going to we're staring down the barrel of um, much greater regulation of technology by government, and we're you know there's a whole conversation going on now in Canberra around uh, with, with industry and critical national infrastructure providers around trying to sort of grip up regulation in that space. We've got the the regulation you mentioned around uh, Facebook and Google social media companies. But I think we're going to have it in, in lots of different areas, whether it's cloud computing, um, 5G technologies, uh, you know, once we get to quantum computing, artificial intelligence, all of those things I think will have really strong government regulation uh, because at the end of the day, these technologies are having massive changes on the way that we operate, whether it's um, on businesses like um, the, the media and journalism, whether it's um, social cohesion uh, issues, if it's the way we run our democracy, um, or it's whether it's the way companies operate and, and how they can tell whether somebody is who they say they are or if it sounds like the CEO, but it actually isn't. All of these things that need to be sort of grappled with by government um, to enable us to keep on functioning properly as a society. So I think regulation is, is coming, but the tricky part there is how do you do that internationally? So if we end up with just every country going out and making its own regulation on all these topics, you end up with just a, a, a total mess of global regulation on dealing with companies that essentially you know, should be seamlessly transnational because the technology should be able to be rolled out you know, anywhere and used anywhere. If we have to start customising every bit of technology to comply with every single law and regulation in every environment, we're going to lose all of the... Um, scale, scaling effects that we've had from things like cloud, um, where it's just a sort of off the shelf, shelf fantastic solution that can be deployed anywhere to one where it has to, you know, make sure in Indonesia it complies with this particular law and in Australia with, you know, these three laws and, and Thailand some other laws. So that's going to really gum up the system, I think, and, and inhibit innovation and, um, you know, the, the benefits that we get from from technologies, but it, it's still going to be inevitable. The other piece to this, I think, uh, which is is really interesting, is the geopolitics. So we're coming to this pivot point, I think, where uh, there's this tech decoupling going on, where governments are starting to realise that, um, particularly the way that um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is starting to interact in the international system means that the old assumptions that we could just uh, integrate all our supply chains and have China sort of deeply embedded in those supply chains would work. Um, I think the, the perception now from many governments around the world is that that, has, that isn't going to work, it's too high risk and there needs to be a decoupling um, to some extent. So how that's going to play out I think is, is still being worked out but what you could end up with is I think two different product lines, uh, one that's sort of designed for um, um, mainland China um, and then another that's designed for the rest of the world and there might need customization for different wars within each of those 
um, jurisdictions as well. Um, the other thing you, you might start to see is companies just completely removing themselves uh, from Chinese supply chains or high-risk supply chains. Um, and so that's going to probably increase costs of, um, of lots of products in the, in the short term, but lead to a big global restructuring in terms of where lots of these companies have their operations and where they manufacture and, and where the different component parts come from. And for the, the bigger picture there, I think, is much greater oversight of supply chains, not just going sort of one or two layers deep, but going sort of you know right to the bottom so that you know exactly where everything's coming from. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear you say that because that feels like where where I'm thinking that we're heading. Um, and as complex as that is, it almost feels like it's it's inevitable. It's it, it's only going to be in having that um, that providence across supply chains that we'll truly know that. Um, that the device that we're using or that the technology that we're using is safe um, and secure, I guess, is the um, the key piece. I guess in closing, um, Fergus, I mean, there's so many other things that we could talk about, but we are going to run out of time. So in closing, what would be your final comments as we sign off and go back into our days and into our work? What would you like all of us participating today to be thinking about and thinking into when it comes to cybersecurity? Um, I guess to me, cyber, the, my main sort of takeaway would be that cybersecurity is not just for the, the technical IT person in your organisation. It's really something that everyone needs to own. The same way you don't sort of walk into your building and just leave all the doors open and put all the important files at the front door for anyone to, to take a look at. You need to sort of have the same attitude. I think with cybersecurity, it's you know, it's on you to to understand um, what's the risk, and you know, not to click malicious links or download um, you know um, software that might be dam potentially damaging to your organisation. So I think it's a it's an individual ownership thing, and I think it's it's not a it's not a, it doesn't require a technical mind to understand the, the problem here and to understand you know the board solution. So I think boards really need to um, grapple with this problem. Um, really start raising this as, as a board, a board level and an executive level to understand, you know, what the nature of their risk profile is and what they're doing to try and, you know, minimise that. So, my view, my message would be, it's not that technical, and you don't need to be technical to understand, you know, the basics of what you're dealing with here, and that it's also everyone has a role to play in trying to fix it. Awesome. Well, I've got to say, I will stop thinking about the whole quantum resistance thing because uh, it is very reassuring that we have someone like you heading up an international cyber policy centre within ASPE. So I feel like it's in good hands. So I'm going to hand it back to you. And in doing so, um, thank you for joining me today and hand over to Stephen Durkin, CEO of Oz IMM, to offer some closing comments. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Fergus, it uh, falls to me to have the great uh, honour of passing a, a vote of thanks. Uh, I hope you agree. That's been a uh, quite stimulating conversation, wide roaming, covered a whole heap of areas. The, the, the purpose and objective of the Thought Leadership Series is to really uh, elevate our thinking and to look at our industry from a range of perspectives. And I'm sure you agree that uh, there's been some really major reflections coming out of that. I, I, I think. Um, for mine, I really like the way Fergus you position this. This is not a geek topic. This is not a technical issue. You've made it pretty clear to us that cyber security is not just a, an IT problem. It's, it's a human problem. Um, and for mine, the second reflection has been very much on the role of OzIMM. OzIMM represents professionals that work in the industry. Uh, this is a very complex industry that we work in. It requires sophisticated solutions. And I think the role of the professional has really been highlighted through this conversation today. Clear, very evident that moving forward, the resources sector needs to draw on the skills and the talent and the experience of a wide range of professionals, um, covering all parts of the value chain, uh, covering all areas like IT, digital transformation, policy, whatever it may be, all parts um, of the value chain have a critical role to play to make sure that we get, get this right and deliver better outcomes um, as we look to grow and shape uh, shaper industry. So thank you very, very much, Fergus. You've um, really uh, led us led us uh, in a very, very uh, thought-provoking conversation today. Thanks 
again, and as always, to Kat, um, you've really created a very interesting topic there and made that a very, very engaging conversation. For those that uh, who want to learn more about the topic of cybersecurity, I did want to let everyone know that OzIMM is running an upcoming cybersecurity course as part of our Mining 4.0 Academy. Uh, it's a three-week course. It's uh, getting some uh, fantastic feedback from those that are attending. It will delve more deeply into the cyber security landscape for all the reasons that uh, Fergus has talked about today. It will provide practical tools and guidance on how to create an ethical cyber security culture. The course begins on the 26th of October. And if you want to hear more or find out more about that course, I'd encourage you to go and visit, uh, visit our website. Before we sign off, I would like to thank again our Thought Leadership Series partners. Uh, this series has been a great success. We've uh, had around 1,000 people register to attend the series uh, from 41 countries around the world. Uh, a large part of the success has been the support that we have had from our signature partner, PwC, our major partners, the So Systems, Rio Tinto and Mets Ignited, and of course, all of our series and supporting partners. We finish up our series next Tuesday with former NASA astronaut and Space Shuttle Commander, Pamela Melroy. There's immense interest in this topic. Uh, as I said, the Thought Leadership Series is all about looking at our industry from a different perspective and expanding our thinking. So uh, Pamela will lead a fascinating discussion on the new technologies emerging in the space industry. Pamela will explore how resources professionals, specialists in remote operations can play a significant role in the future of space programs, including space mining. It'll be a great way to wrap up our series. We hope to see you all again on Tuesday. Thank you. Have a great morning, a great day, or a great night, wherever in the world you are. Uh, stay safe. Thank you for your support.